الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين <coughs> so tonight um have two orders of business uh the first order of business is uh, to do uh somewhat of a reset and i'll begin that reset with uh an apology so when we started the commentary on kitab at-tawhid one of the goals or one of the the things i want to make sure that i achieved was to simplify the topic and make it accessible because the topic has a tendency uh to be um decim to be highly concentrated um to be um inaccessible and it can be complicated at times if it's not simplified And so my goal was to make it as simplified and as accessible as possible, as clear to understand as possible. And I feel like of late the last few lessons um somehow some way I got off track and failed to do that. And so there was there were times where I just felt like the message wasn't coming across as clearly and as simply as I had initially set out to do. and i feel like that might be part not entirely the reason why the attendance is kind of kind of fallen because people come and they just feel like i'm speaking over their heads and so they kind of um they tap out why do you come so long like so the commitment uh, going forward uh, as we reset is one to shorten the lessons so usually we are, we have somewhere between an hour a little less than an hour uh to do our program So the intention is to shorten lessons and to speak maybe for 30 minutes or so and that will give us more time to review the content we covered because when you review it uh things that you missed the first time around you'll get questions that you have uh you'll have an opportunity to ask and we'll have an opportunity to discuss and through those reviews the questions the discussions the content will become clearer as opposed to loading you up with a bunch of con- content giving you an intellectual overload you leave here and you you leave with nothing and last but not least what we hope to do in the future moving forward is to incorporate wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to incorporate visual aids when appropriate and useful when we first started out we used the slides because we were trying to uh, lay the foundation for the topic we use a lot of visual aids and our obviously visual aids uh, are very useful and beneficial and so we want to try to bring those back Um initially our plan was to use the book as a visual aid but a lot of people just don't have the book and they have no intention of purchasing the book. So we could actually um put some of the content of the book on the visual aid. It makes it easier for people to kind of follow what we're doing along with some of the the um the points that we take out of uh the content. um some of the conditions and prerequisites for things sometimes we we enumerate a few things and we say that when these conditions are present this is okay when they're not present it's not okay if we kind of put those up as a visual aid and so the intention is to bring that back inshallah ta'ala um what we're going to have to do is get a um a high end projector uh, we did have access to a projector before we no longer have access to that And so we'll try to get a high end projector if there's somebody who wants to donate and I'm being serious uh then that's great. We welcome that donation. Otherwise, give us a couple of weeks. We're going to get a high end projector in here and you'll start to see some of those visual aids come back as well. So that's huh? So that's what's related to uh the reset part of it. Just uh wanted to be clear to our audience uh that we hear you. Um you're speaking whether you're speaking to us um explicitly and giving us explicit feedback or implicitly through your your absence or your presence but you're kind of like tuned out we're hearing you we 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 hear you and we're going to make the necessary adjustments to make the class better it's the most important topic in our religion and so we have to teach it we could just abandon it and teach something that's more interesting um more exciting but if we did that we would be betraying our duty uh this is a topic that has to be taught and it has to be taught um uh not just once in a lifetime but it's something we have to keep revisiting because of its importance. Uh so with that said, uh, now we'll get to the actual lesson. And what I intend to do today, as I said, we're going to shorten the lessons. So the plan uh today 
uh, is to give an overview of three chapters which are interconnected. So all we're going to do today is give an overview and make sure that we understand what the chapters are talking about before we actually delve into the chapters. So there are three chapters, chapters 15, 16, and 17, which um, are very closely related. And what we've seen that the Imam does throughout the whole book is that he deals with a topic or a series of topics across a series of chapters. He develops that topic as it relates to a Tawheed, and then he goes to the next topic in terms of the natural progression. So we started out talking about um, wujub tawheed the obligatory, the obligatory nature of a Tawheed. It's an obligation upon every uh, created being to practice a Tawheed. Then he follows it up with the Fadl, the virtue of a Tawheed. Then he follows it up with Mayu Kefir Min Dhanub, what a Tawheed will expiate of sins. And he did that to, ex to get us excited about practicing a Tawheed. Then after that, he follows it up with a chapter on fearing, being afraid of a Shirk, the opposite of a Tawheed. That not only should we want to be people who practice a Tawheed, we also should be weary of falling into its opposite, which is a Shirk. Then after that, he talked about a Dawah to Tawheed, a Dawah ila Tawheed, the obligation for us to call, when we invite people to Islam, to call them primarily to the oneness of Allah. Then after that, he talked about Tafsir al Tawheed. What is a Tawheed? How do we explain it? And then after he gave that introductory chapter on explaining what is a Tawheed, he started what? He said, these chapters I'm going to give you after this will provide further explanation. So he starts giving us chapters then where he talks about, um, he talks about acts of worship that should only be offered to Allah. He talks about that. He also talked about or gave a series of chapters that talked about al-asbab, the causality that one of the things that we can't do, one of the things that's an act of shirk, or one of the things that, that is a uh, precursor to shirk is when we establish a cause and effect relationship between two things. So he gave us a bunch of chapters that dealt with that and gave examples of that, that people fall into. Then he gave examples of actual acts of worship that people offer to other deities that are called a shirk. And now he comes to these three chapters. These three chapters which follow that natural progression of where the, the conversation about a Tawheed should go. So I say all that to come back. So we enter this section in the book wherein the Imam seeks to dissect. And I say all that just to say that the Imam follows this natural progression. You're going to see that today in these three chapters, which we're going to give the overview for. So the Imam, in these three chapters, or in this section of the book, he dissects, dismantles, and absolutely destroys the Shubha, the dubious assertion or the spacious argument which is commonly used by the idolaters, whether they be Muslim idolaters or idolaters from other religions. And these are the, these are the assertions or the dubious arguments that they give to justify their worship of false deities, living or dead, animate or inanimate. What do they say? Because after he's talked about the acts of shirk that people do, the first thing that people are going to do is do what? Suppose, what, what do people, people typically do when, when you catch them doing something wrong? Or when you tell them, hey, Aki, this thing that you're doing is wrong. What do people typically do? It's like a knee-jerk reaction. Huh? They get defensive and try to do what? To justify, right? They try to justify. So it's like the imam is saying the natural progression, once you start to expose the acts of shirk that people are doing, Naturally, they're going to become what? Defensive and try to justify. So he's going to do what? He's going to respond to those justifications before they can assert them. You guys see that? This is the natural progression of this discussion, and that's where the imam is right now in chapters 15, 16, and 17. So previously, he mentioned those acts of worship. You guys remember the last section that we dealt with, the imam gave a series of chapters which mention acts of worship that people offer to other than Allah and why Offering those acts of worship is a type of shirk. It's a type of idolatry which contradicts and undermines and nullifies a tawheed. So he started out with a dhabah, sacrificing, offering animal sacrifice to than Allah. Follows that with a nadr, vows. And a vow is basically ilzam al-shakhs nafsahu bil-ibadah 
سواء كان مقابل الشيء أو بدون مقابل. So a vow is when a person basically he requires himself to do an act of worship, whether he's seeking something in return or exchange for that act of worship he does, or he's not seeking anything. So it's very common for people uh, when they worship other deities to say, I vow to do this. I vow to do that. And they're doing it as an offering to that deity. And in many cases, they'll make that vow in exchange for something else. So they'll say, for example, I vow to fast 30 days if my son gets cured of this illness. I vow to, um, I, I vow to give this amount of money in charity if I'm given, if Allah grants me this promotion, etc. They make these vows. So this is another thing he mentioned, vows, as an act of worship, which people tend to have a tendency to offer them to other than Allah. Then he mentioned a dua. These, uh, the invoking of these deities and asking them for our material or spiritual needs, which a lot of people do. They'll, they'll call upon these false deities. Then he mentioned specific forms of dua, like al istighatha, which is seeking ref rescue from a perilous predicament. A person's in a jam and they do what? They call out to someone to save them from that difficult situation. Or al istiadha, where a person seeks refuge in these false deities from some feared or impending harm. And these chapters he gave, he didn't mention them as the only acts of worship which constitute a shirk. He mentioned them as examples. Not to say these are the only ones, but they're just examples to show you basically that offering an act of worship to anyone or anything besides Allah is an act of shirk. Regardless of the act that you offer, and regardless of the one that, or the status of the one you offer it to. So this is what he was setting the table for. This is what he was talking about in these last few chapters. Now he comes and he follows these, these chapters. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. He follows these chapters as if I'm cutting you off at the pass. I know that after I basically establish that offering an act of worship to other than Allah is an act of shirk, the first thing these people who do this these people go to shrines and temples and they do these things. They sacrifice animals, they prostrate, they uh, make vows, they make supplications and invocations. The first thing those people are going to do is say, oh, we have a justification for that. We can defend that. These acts which seem indefensible, we can defend it. So in these three chapters, he's like, I'm going to basically take your knees out from underneath you. I'm going to refute and demolish this house of cards argument that you people typically use to justify offering acts of worship to other than Allah. So the argument that they use basically is what? Is that these false deities that they worship or they offer these acts of worship to can somehow benefit those who are devoted to them independently. They can somehow benefit you independently. You ask them for something and they, actually, they can actually give you what you ask for. They believe that. Or they say they can at least benefit you by way of a shafa'a, by way of intercession. They can intercede on your behalf with Allah. So perhaps they actually can give you what you're asking for. Or because of the special status they have with Allah, they can intercede and Allah will give you what you've asked them for. Right? That's their argument. And just to give you a clear understanding, not just of the argument itself, but why it's wrong. I'm going to give you a practical example from the world that's pretty common. So right now we're just going to offer a practical example from our worldly life so that we can see what's happening, the argument that they give and why it's, it's, it's a, a weak argument, a false argument, right? Or a false justification. So imagine, and this is something that happen, happens all the time. Imagine there's a person who wants to be employed in a powerhouse company. A company that um, values its employees, compensates them exceptionally well, and gives them exceptional career opportunities. He wants to be employed in this company. And he wants to be employed not just as a lower level employee, but he wants to be one of the more um, higher, uh, well-respected, and um, exceptionally compensated employees, right? So one of the things people typically do when they want to do something like that 
is they look for what? For connections. Is that, is that true? Is that true? That's something we do in real life. People look for connections. But so this person, you ask him, you say, okay, well, you want to get this job, high power job, high power company. How are you going to do it? What are you going to do? What's your strategy? He says, well, I know a guy named Marty who works in the mailroom. And I'm going to talk to him and see if he can make it happen. What's our response? What's your response? Marty works in the mail room. Huh? Not a good idea. Why? Why is it not a good idea? He doesn't have the authority. Doesn't have the power. Doesn't have the juice. Right? He works in the mail room. He can't even get you hired in what? In the mail room. And even if he could get you hired in the mail room, is that what you want? No, you want to be what? You. you want to be in the upper echelon, right? Okay. So the problem with that line of thinking is that Marty doesn't have the authority, doesn't have the power, isn't in position to do what you want him to do. So to ask him would be foolish. Like this is a said, wouldn't be a good idea. It would be foolish. Why are you asking him? Y'all see that? You guys with me? Are we tracking together? So he takes a step back and says, yeah, you're right. Don't make sense. You know what? I actually, I think I saw on LinkedIn that such and such person is the assistant to the director of recruitment and retention. The assistant to the director of recruitment and retention. Let me talk to them. And maybe they can do what? Maybe they can do what? Starts with an I, ends with an E. Maybe they can enter, intercede. Put in a good word. Y'all feel me? That makes sense? Do people do that in real life? Always. That this person is close enough to the director of recruitment and retention. The director of what? Hiring. They can intercede on my behalf. Put in a good word and they'll, they'll hire me. Okay? Does that make sense? Just on the surface of it, on the face of it? It, it kind of makes sense. We can say, oh, that could be a dangerous endeavor but yeah they they're close enough they're in their orbit maybe they could help you you guys see that but suppose suppose that this director of recruitment and retention has made a decree he's issued a memo he says i don't like connections i don't like anybody coming to me on behalf of somebody else if anybody does that I'm going to fire the one who came, right? And I'm going to blacklist the one who asked him to come, right? That person will never be hired by this company. So if he has that memo out there, would that be a good idea? We say, no, that would be foolhardy. It would be foolish for you. You're ruining yourself. And not only that, you're hurting what? The other person as well. Y'all guys see that? So basically, what the imam does in these three chapters, if we take it back to a Tawheed, is he says, basically, that in these three chapters, there's no justification for what you people do in terms of what? Committing these acts of shirk, whether you do it because you believe that the ones that you offer these acts of worship to are independently powerful. They can bring about the desired result. They can give you what you want. They can't do that because they're like Marty. In the mailroom, they don't have the power. They don't have the authority on the Jews. Then if you say, well, no, 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 no. They don't have the Jews themselves. They're not independently, pow independently powerful, but they might be able to make a shafa. They might be able to make intercession. The imam says, no, nope. they can't even do that because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said he doesn't allow what? Intercession except with specific conditions that these people don't, don't fulfill. They don't check the boxes. You guys see that? So this is basically what the imam does in these three chapters. So he starts out with chapter number 15. And these chapters, or the first two of them at least, he doesn't give them a specific title, but he titles them with an ayah. So the first chapter, he titles it with the ayah in which he says, <laughs> He 
He says in this, uh, the first chapter, he says, do they associate partners with the law who have not created anything, but are themselves created? They are unable to help others and cannot even help what? Cannot help themselves. Like Martin in the mailroom. He's in the mailroom. He, he can't even move up. Right. He's stuck in the low level position he's in. He can't even help himself. How can he help somebody else? You guys see that? And what does the imam mean by this chapter? Because he develops it with other ayat and some hadith. He's talking about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because there are people who actually call upon the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There are people who actually pray to him and ask him for their needs. Okay? So in this particular chapter, he's talking about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he's saying that the Prophet Muhammad is the most superior human being. He's the greatest of Allah's creation. And therefore, he's the most righteous of the righteous people. Because a lot of these people, when they call out to people, they call them these saintly people. They say, oh, this guy is so pious. He's so righteous. So the imam brings what? The most righteous and the most pious of all the pious people. And he brings him to show that he doesn't have the power, the independent authority to do anything for anyone. Right? He doesn't have the independent authority to do anything for anyone. So anybody underneath him, lower than him in rank, doesn't have what? The power. So if you called upon, for example, uh, Ali and radiallahu anhu, you called upon Fatima or anyone else from the Sahaba, Ashab Rasulullah or a person called upon uh, some righteous person or somebody they think is righteous, like Al-Badawi, Abdul Qadr Al-Jailani. You have these people out there, saintly people that people actually pray to. This is not something I'm making up. It's not hyperbole, right? People that some, we go to different uh, programs here in Colombia, you might be praying next to somebody else who actually what? They will say, yeah, Bedawi Aghithni. You overhear this, man. Medid, medid, you know, asking them for their needs. I say that to say that this is a real thing and there are people who do this. And so the Imam, he says, listen, if the greatest of Allah's creatures, the most pious of all the pious people, if he himself doesn't have the independent authority to do anything, for anyone, right? Not even for his own self. And he gives examples of this. He said, how much more is this true for the people who are lower than him in rank? Whoever you call on, no matter who you call on, is not gonna be as high as the Prophet ﷺ. Not as pious as the Prophet ﷺ. And so whoever you call upon, if the Prophet can't, doesn't have the independent authority, this person doesn't have it either. Then by that, he comes to chapter 16. He comes to chapter 16. And again, he doesn't title it with a title, but rather he puts an ayah as the title. And the ayah that he used, the ayah in which he says, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, حَتَّى إِذَا فُزِّ عَنْ قُلُوبِهِمْ قَالُوا مَاذَا قَالَ رَبُّكُمْ قَالَ الْحَقِّ وَهُوَ الْعَلِيُّ الْكَبِيرُ He said, he brings this ayah. He says, once fear has left their hearts, underscore the word or the phrase, their hearts. They say, what is it that your Lord has said? They say the truth, and he is the most high, the most great. Who is there? Anybody want to take a guess? When he said, once fear has left their hearts. Anybody want to take a guess who there is? No, actually, it's not the day of judgment. It's not the day of judgment. So who is it that, who is there then? The angels. Yes, subhanAllah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about when he is about to make a decree. He's, when, the, when he's about to make a decree, there's this like, this sound, this unbearable sound that comes and it strikes fear in the hearts of the angels. You guys know who the angels are? You know what they are? The angels are beings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that the Prophet has described, some of them, as being so big that a bird could fly from one shoulder of the angel to another shoulder of the angel. And it would take it what? 500. Yeah, it would take 500 years. <laughs> Come on, man. From this part, this large shoulder, 500 years traveling. Khafaqan tayr, flying. He said this about the angels. Not only that, the angels, one description the prophet gave of Jibreel was that he saw him with 600 wings that did what? That completely covered the horizon. Huge. 
powerful being, so powerful that Jibreel alone, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed that he was going to destroy the people of Lut, the people of Lot, he had the angels send down what? These stones, this fire and brimstone, right? Right? They were just throwing them with these stones. Then he ordered Jibreel to come screaming down upon them. And he picked up the whole town, the whole town, mind you, with the tip of his wing. Come on, these, these, these are not ordinary beings. These are beings of extreme size, power, might. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to give his decree, their hearts are what? Filled with fear. To the point that what? They faint. Hatta ida fuzian kalubihim. And then when they, the fear leaves their hearts and they return and recover, they say, what did your Lord say? Right? He is the most high, the all-knowing, the all-aware. I'm sorry, Al-Kabir, the great. So, now think about this now. This is the reality of the angels and this is what happens to them when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks his, his decree. What's the message that the Imam is giving in this chapter by starting it with this ayah? He's saying, look, this is proof that the angels in general and the greatest of the angels, Jibreel, has no power to help, no power independently to help anybody or to do anything for anyone. Because what? Allah is showing that they're weak. They're lacking. They are, their power is uh, subject it is um, subjected to, it's superseded by the power of Allah. They don't have the independent power. So if this is the case for the angels, then what about people lower than them in rank, like human beings, the people that these people call upon? You guys see that? So right there, the imam gives two body blows to the argument of the idolaters, right? So what do the idolaters come back with? Okay, okay, okay. These people, they don't have independent power. We don't believe they have God-like powers. Let not tuck it feed him. We don't believe that they are gods in and of themselves. But we believe they have what? Ahsan, they have the ability to make a shafa. They can intercede. They're like what? The assistant to the director of recruitment and retention. Right? They don't have the authority to hire us. But they can go and say, hey, this is my man. Give him a gig. They can intercede, right? So then the Imam, he comes with what the, 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 the 17th chapter, which he called Baba Shafa'ah, the chapter of intercession. Because I'm going to now do what? I'm going to destroy your house of cards argument that these people can make a Shafa'ah independently of Allah. So basically in their mind, they believe that if they win the approval of these intermediaries, they have these intermediaries, whether it's a saint, whether it's an angel, whether it's a prophet, whatever it is that they're offering these acts of worship to, acts of devotion, they feel like if we win the approval of these intermediaries, these saints or saintly people, that they can, these saints, listen to this, the saints can make Allah do something against his will. Basically, they can make Allah do something against his will. Or at the very least, Allah has given these intermediaries the right to intercede with him on behalf of others, whoever they choose, and that Allah has for forfeited any choice in the matter. That if they come and they want to intercede, Allah will do what? Accept their intercession and he forfeits the choice to decide. This is what they believe. I'm asking you, is either, both of them are bad, right? Either you believe that they can make Allah do something against his will. Can anybody make Allah do anything against his will? And to, and to think that, Look how far away people can go if they really don't mind their tawheed. And if they don't really study a tawheed, they can get to the point where you actually think a human being, a saintly person, or an angel, or a jinn, can make Allah do something that he doesn't want to do. That's the first thing. Or at the very least, Allah has given them, they're so special, Allah has given them carte blanche. That hey, you can intercede on, on behalf of whoever you want, even if I don't like them. Even if I'm not pleased with them. You can intercede on their behalf. Both of them are wrong. Right? Allah is never going to be in a position where he's uh, 
Exactly. Exactly. He's never going to be in a position where somebody has the upper hand and can make him do something he doesn't want to do, or they can make him approve of someone he doesn't want to approve of. طيب. So the Imam, he brings this chapter where he refutes this assertion by providing the proof that there is no interception except by Allah's, Allah's will and with his permission. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never gives permission unless he's pleased with the Shafi, the one who's going to intercede, and also pleased with the one on behalf he intercedes. You guys see that? As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and he gives, this is one of the ayat that he brings in that chapter, but there are many ayat, and we're going to look at them closely uh, next, next, next lesson. But one of the ayat comes from Surah Al-Najm where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكَمْ مِنْ مَلَكٍ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ لَا تُغْنِي شَفَاعَتُهُمْ شَيْئًا أَمْ لَا تُغْنِي شَفَاعَتُهُمْ شَيْئًا إِلَّا مِنْ بَعْدِ إِنْ يَأْذَنَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا مِنْ بَعْدِ إِنْ يَأْذَنَ اللَّهُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَلْضَى So how abundant is the number of angels in the heavens, but even their intercession will not avail a person in the least, except after Allah grants his permission to whoever he wills to intercede, and only on behalf of those he approves. You guys see that? So the imam brings that to show you asking these people for something that they don't even have what? They don't even own that. They can't just intercede willy-nilly for whoever they will. But they need Allah's permission. And they're only going to be able to intercede for the people who Allah is pleased with. Then, then the imam, he says, or he brings the, the indication that Allah is only going to be pleased. He's only going to allow intercession for the people of a tawheed. So you people who are doing shirk and thinking, oh, I'm going to get this saint to intercede, even if the saint was someone who Allah would approve of his intercession, he won't approve it on your behalf because of what? Because of your shirk. So he mentions the hadith collected by Muslim and taught to Abu Huraira, in which Abu Huraira asked the Prophet, he said, Man asad al nasi bi shafa'atik yawm al qiyamah. He said, Who is the person who will be most delighted by your intercession on his behalf on the day of resurrection? So the Prophet said, Man qala la ilaha illallah khalisa min qalbi. He said, The one who bears witness to Allah's oneness, who practices a tawheed. And he does that sincerely from his heart. These are the people I'm, that, that I'll be able to intercede for. If, if they don't do that, I won't be able to intercede on their behalf. So this is basically an overview of the chapters we're going to get into. So we'll get into more detail and we'll look at all of the nusus that the, the sheikh or the imam uh, provides in that vein. But I just wanted to make sure that we had a tasawwur. You know, we had this basically um, general understanding of what we're dealing with and also the progression. After the imam talked about uh, causality and how many people commit shirk by what? By way of giving or a, 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 a establishing a cause and effect relationship between things. That this thing can bring about this outcome independent of Allah's will. That's one way that people commit shirk. Rabbits feed and lucky charms and, you know... Um, horseshoes and, and certain amulets that people wear, right? That's one way. And it's, it's one of those ways that's incon inconspicuous and many Muslims do it. We talked about that, right? People are hanging things in their car and hanging things on their door, etc. Then after that, the imam shifted to what? Actual acts of worship people do and offer to these saintly beings and other deities or false deities, thinking that they can get close to them or that, they can, that Allah is pleased with this, etc. But it's actually shirk. Then after that, he transitions and says, oh, these people are going to try to justify it. And this is how they're going to justify it. Typically, they justify it by saying what? These saintly people have juice, right? They're independently powerful, right? So he undermines that. He kneecaps that. And then after that, he comes and he says, these people say, no, 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 they don't. They're not independently powerful. We don't. But, but they have the ability to intercede. So he does what? He refutes that. And these are the chapters that we're going to take uh, in the coming week, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, any questions, uh, comments, or uh, clarity needed on that? Father Sheikh. Yes, uh, back to the angels, they can also come in the form of human beings our side. Yeah, they can, they can come in many forms. They can, they, and they have come. There are, uh, there are a number of uh, texts, authentic texts, where they came in the form of human beings. One of the most famous ones is what they call Hadith Jibreel, right? Toward the end of the Prophet's life, uh, there's a very famous Hadith, وسلم, where he was sitting with his companions. And it's narrated by Umar al-Khattab. It's a very famous hadith. So he was sitting with his companions and they said suddenly there appeared on the, on the horizon a man who, had, who was wearing extremely white 
garments and his hair was jet black. And he went on to say, he said, لا يعرفه منا أحد. Okay. لا يعرفه منا أحد. نعم ولا وما وما كان عليه أثر السفر أحسن جزاك الله خير. So he said there were two things that stood out about him. So we're looking at his clothes. They are perfectly white, like they just came out of the of of, of the dryer, right, or out of the dry cleaners, right? And his hair was jet black. لا يعرفه منا أحد. None of us knew him. Which means he's not from Al Medina, which will give you the impression he's a traveler. Okay, and there was no indication that he had been traveling. So that what that made them like, like sit straight up and who is this? Because back in that time, if you've been traveling, are your clothes going to be white? Is your hair going to be black? Jet black? No, it's going to be dusty, right? From either walking or riding a horse or whatever, getting caught in a sandstorm, whatever. So, you know, the hadith, famous hadith, where the, 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 this person who came in the form of a man, as far as they could tell, he sat in front of the prophet and the hadith says he put his hands on his knees and some of the, the it could be interpreted, he put his hands on the prophet's knees and it could also be interpreted he put his hands on his own knees and he sat knee to knee, really close to the prophet. And he started asking him his questions. He said, Akhbirni an Islam, tell me about Islam. Akhbirni an Iman, tell me about faith. Akhbirni an al Ihsan, tell me about Excellence. Then he told him, he said, He said, tell me when is the hour or when is the hour? And he said, I know, the one you're asking knows no more about it than the one who, who asked. But I can tell you about what? It's signs. Al-Muhim, after he left, the prophet sat there for a while. And Omar said, I sat as well. And other people dispersed, but I sat there as well. And then I asked, he said, the prophet asked me, he said, do you know who that was? Ya yeah, Omar. He said, Allahu wa Rasulhu Alam, Allah and His Messenger know best. He said, That Jibreel, Atakum Yu Alimukum Dinakum. He said, That was Jibreel, the angel Gabriel, the one who he said, you know, from one ear to the to the shoulder was five hundred, you know, years of, of flying by a bird, right? The one who with the tip of his wing, you know, took up the whole town of, of Lut and slammed it down. And the one who the Prophet said, I saw him in his natural form, six hundred wings that did what? that covered the whole sky, he came in the form of what? An ordinary man that the people saw. Exactly. Another example in, in, in the Quran, those angels who came, before they came to Lut, they came to who? Ibrahim. And when they came, they were people he didn't know, but as far as he could tell, they were human beings. So what did Ibrahim do? Immediately, he went, he slaughtered an animal, he roasted it, and he presented it for him. And they didn't when they didn't eat because that's not normal. That's not normal. Just like you have to be hospitable. It was from it, it's from the it, it's from the natural qualities of Islam to be hospitable. Somebody comes, they have to get something. They have to get if it's just a glass of water. Right. But it's also from the nature of Islam and just general manners that when somebody offers you something, you do what? Yeah, you take it. Right. So when they didn't put their hands to it. Yeah, he got afraid. He said, whoa, what is this about? And they said, don't be afraid. We're not eating because we're angels. And we came to destroy the people of Luth. But as far as he could tell, they were human beings. So you're absolutely right. The angels have a tendency when they come to man to come in the form of human beings. And they're able to do that. They're able to change forms. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, lie, it's a good question. I, I don't know. I don't know. Unless it specifies in the... Yeah. If, 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 if it doesn't specify in the hadith, we just leave it at that. We just don't know. Yeah. We just don't know. Something that popped up because we do know of the angels coming in certain forms. You know what I mean? I'm going to go back. I'm going to him in that way, mashallah. And then when... The question just, like I say, just come to mind. And I think when the when the Prophet Sallallahu when he did when he first um, when Jibril came and opened his chest when he was about uh, four or five years old uh, in uh, in uh, I think Beni Sa'd, um, Jibril came in the form of a man. He didn't come in the form of an angel because they would have been more afraid of his form than they would have been of what he did to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we have indication, even though the, the hadith doesn't specify, we have indication that he came in the form of a man. 
Because why? The fact that he came didn't scare the kids. They only got scared when he opened the prophet's chest. And as far as they could tell, he, he had killed the prophet. Exactly. He had killed the prophet. So that's when they ran. So his presence didn't frighten them. But if he came in the form of an angel, they would have his presence would have likely frightened them or would have been the first thing they mentioned. Uh, so there's some indication that he came in the form of a man. But if we just get it that the angel came, we don't know whether it was in the form of a man or in the form in his, his natural form or in some other form. But my fellowship. There's one thing about the, uh, some people are thought in wedding and the instructions. Hey. What you are so powerful and you can help when they make this the earth. Or, hey. or you said, yeah, by the way, or you had Subhanallah, that. subhanallah. One of the funny, st funny story about a Jew Hey. He said one day there's a Bedouin who was walking in the desert and there's uh, one who uh, just robbed him and, and he made that way. He said, yeah, Jew so a Jew he wasn't a member, so he take his shoes and throw it away. Mm -hmm. Immediately she had the, uh, this. <laughs> <laughs> so what is this funny story? Uh -huh. And immediately just like disappeared. Hey. And also about the another, uh, one of the men, Arifai. Mm -hmm. So he went to the uh, Amalia, to go to the Prophet Muhammad. And they said in uh, the front of the grave, they said, Ya Rasulullah, I came from so far. Hey. So immediately the hand of the Prophet came out of the grave. Subhanallah. Hey. Shake hand. Hey. And he said, A hundred thousand of your people will be washed. Mm. So like, they make like some hey. extra, extra, extra. Yeah, to justify, to justify and their to, beliefs. Uh, to convince. You see, you see what happened? Hey. They are... So we must be on the right path. Allah must sign what they to plan. Also, and the one thing also, I'm sorry to make it long. No, no. The, the brother, the brother of Salam at Mi'raj trapped. So with the Gabriya, the Gabriya Ali Salam, who is so powerful. Mm -hmm. The Prophet says, at the Mi'raj, he says, Ra'aytu Jibreel, yawma yawma usri abi, ra'aytu kalhils al-bali. Mm -hmm. Right? Eh. You see, like, just from khashyat Allah. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Eh. And the Prophet of Salam, like, uh, when, the, uh, when the time comes, mm. like, when he sends the Sibla to Nikah, eh. uh, he, he, he was uh, talking to Jibreel, he was, you will leave me here? He said, yes, I cannot. So Go beyond, cannot, subhanallah. This is, this is my limit. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So even with this mm -hmm. time of powerful, he said, Lan yadkhul ahad in the eh. Which will you act kid? It just confirms that their authority yeah. is what's given to them by Allah, not something they have which is independent. And, and I want to say this just to emphasize um, to everyone that we might listen to some of these things and say, how silly, you know, how foolish. Yeah. But we have to understand that there is an entire religion which is built upon the worship of a prophet. There's an entire religion built upon the worship of a prophet and the belief that he is the deity. It's built upon uh, a theology which nobody can understand. Nobody can understand or explain to others. Right? It's built upon that. How does that happen? How does a whole religion become built upon the belief that God is one of three and three in one? And how does a whole you know, group of people or religious faith group or denomination spend their entire waking days praising and thanking and singing and, and, and worshiping and lauding a prophet instead of God himself. Some of us have relatives. Some of us have relatives who something great will happen to them. Something tremendous will happen to them, right? It could be that somebody who was terminally ill gets cured. Somebody who was in a coma, awakened from the coma, right? Someone who was in what appeared to be a fatal accident somehow avoids death. And their response will be, thank you, Jesus. Come on, man. We have relatives who do this. They don't say, thank you, God. God is not on, on, their, on their radar. You drive down, um, you drive down 26 headed toward Charleston. There are several billboards that say, Jesus, forgive my sins. Jesus, forgive my sins. Okay? There's a whole religion built upon worshiping a prophet instead of Allah. Muslims cannot be so foolish to think 
that if we don't safeguard our Tawheed, if we don't study a Tawheed, if we don't create a force field around our faith that prevents idolatry from seeping in gradually, gradually, that we won't reach that point. And there are actually some Muslims who what, as he said, have reached that point where they get into a trouble, to a difficult situation, they call upon al-Bedawi, they call upon Jailani, they call upon the Prophet Muhammad, they call upon others besides Allah. That's, that's, that's just what works. Huh? Subhanallah. So that's just what works because you know, send the axes. Of course, mashallah, speak loudly in the words. <laughs> because any any type of wrong action within that, you know, uh, within that, I mean, you can have tawheed as speaking on it with the tongue, mm -hmm. but the limbs are also is a different thing. Yeah. So you, it's, it's, it's circ within the action as well. And alhamdulillah, inshallah, I'm pretty sure that you will get to that, mm -hmm. inshallah, as, as, as we go through the book. But uh, a shirk is not just with the tongue, it's also with the limbs as well. You know what I mean? so, no question. Many things fall in categories of shirk. And that's why I prefer to say, mashallah, you have to be very uh, vigilant. We have to be vigilant. We have to take it seriously. Yeah. And we can't just consider, <laughs> come on, man, this is, this is a waste of time. Why are we talking about this? We're monotheists. Yeah. That's what they say. Yeah. That's what they say. Ask them. I've, I've sat with people who are my colleagues uh, and they believe in... Uh, a tethleth, they believe in the Trinity, and they'll say, you know, we're, you know, we're, one the, we're we, I mean the Christians, is what the, he says, we're one of the monotheistic religions. They believe that they're monotheists, despite they are totally uh, delusional. Okay, they've lost understanding. They've totally lost their way. This can happen to us too. And the Prophet warned against this, and he said in the Hadith, he said, "Let the You will follow the footsteps of the people came before you. And the prophet isn't saying this to inform us, he's saying this to warn us. Don't follow them, saying don't follow them. And he says, you will follow them like the tail of an arrow follows its point. Meaning what? Exactly, you'll do exactly what they do, right? And then he said, even if they entered the hole of a lizard and they got stuck inside, right? And you see they're in an awful predicament. They're like, help, I can't get out. We would do what? We will follow them in there. And so this is when, we, when, you, when you hear that, you have to apply that across the board, but especially to what? The worst thing we could do, which is to associate partners with Allah. And so we have to be careful. We have to be vigilant. And these three chapters are some of the most important chapters in the book. Why? Because they refute the justification. They refute the justification. Any person can make a mistake, can fall into something. But... The door is open for you to repent as long as you don't justify and feel uh, in the right, feel entitled to do the wrong thing. You guys see that? Didn't Adam sin? Didn't Iblis sin? They both sinned, right? They, and they sinned relatively close to each other. One of them was forgiven. One of them wasn't forgiven. What was the difference? They both sinned, right? Not just the belief in Allah, but... Iblis did what? He felt justified in what he did. I did the wrong thing and what? I, I, and I was right about it. Insistent. Right? Insistent. Whereas Adam, he said, Exactly. He said, Oh my Lord, we have indeed wronged ourselves. We, were, we had no right to do what we did. And if you don't forgive us and, and, and have, have mercy upon us, we'll be from the losers. You see the difference? And so this is the key thing is that as long as we learn about this Tawheed and learn how people typically justify it and totally avoid accepting those justifications or any other justification, there's hope for us. But as soon as we start being from the people and you see the people who are so committed to these false beliefs and these false acts, they are just adamant. You see, how do they get there? because they somehow internalize these justifications. These people have power or they can intercede. They can intercede. They have power themselves or at the very least they can intercede. And so they're clinging to that, that we can ask them because they have special status with Allah. If we ask them for something, they can make Allah or they can convince Allah to what? To give us what we're asking for. And so again, the justification is the dangerous part. And this is why these three chapters are so important. Not the fellowship. About the, uh, the Western and how, and how they are acting in the, the Muslim countries and how, and from the history, one uh, real story, 
from our head store. I'm from Egypt, basically. So most of most of our land is like from 90 to 95 percent desert. Hey. And the green area from the north till the around the line. One of the minister after uh, the new show of religion and stuff, out of, mm -hmm. he is who came after the kingdom, you know, the kingdom and the Farouk. Yeah, in the early 50s, Farouk, hey. Yeah. Hey. He mentioned this real story. He said, we, when we are traveling down in the south part, okay, we find many shrines. And these shrines belong to some, he said, Wali, Wali, Wali. But this area basically is no one living. Hey. It's a desert. Hey. How did this come? So what, what after searching, what he found out, the British, when they are in, 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 in Egypt, they have, they have some centers, they make some studies and they will see about the mentality of those people. Mm -hmm. So they realize that the Egyptians, they like Sufism and they like Wali, 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 Wali. Mm -hmm. He said, okay, well, we need to, instead of this, this population are, are only around the Delta, we need to spread them. So how to spread them? It's a desert. Hey. He said, you know what? Okay, just make a camp and everything. I said, hey, Wali uh, Muhammad ibn Ibrahim. Subhanallah. Eh. See, when the, because you see <coughs> the, the emotions of the Egyptians around mm -hmm. the fort with the Wali. Mm -hmm. Okay, here is the Wali, this is the Wali, this is the Wali. And the higher, they moved. And they hired some people to be serving for the Wali shrine. Mm -hmm. So the people come each year for the birthday of the Wali. Mm -hmm. Now the, the business start and around the same. Yeah. See how those evil thinking. Subhanallah. They are not but so if the Muslims for have that kind of mentality and think and just spend spend some time about the how the Western thought about the Muslims. Yeah. They will, will never be at this situation, but yeah. they are they are working day and night. How we can invade? So the, the, because the, well, what they found was after after long time of military invasion, mm. they stay fifty years here, sixty years in Algeria, they stay. 130 years Subhanallah. and after that they left so what they realized is so how those people are so strong strong from the religion hey now we, we got the, the weak in their religion yeah, yeah. now we, we we have the diagnosis now we have to work out how to destroy the religion subhanallah so if we say don't be a muslim say no we are muslim so destroy inside just make like make them weak inside. yeah in terms weak of their faith yeah and this is a sophism and this is one of the the big stuck on that, I don't know what to say. This is one of the, and the, one of the big, biggest quarrels say the, uh, the Sophia, he a mustanqa on ash, the, the dirty jungle for Shia. Subhanallah. Because the, the, the Shia come to the Sophia, mm -hmm. because we, we are from Al Bayt. Eh? You like Al Bayt? Yes, we are from Al Bayt. Yeah, you okay? have to you have to like us. So this is, he comes to the, the, the dirty jungle. No, no, it's 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 it's, it's, for it's for funny. No, no, it's 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 funny that you mention that, and we're going to close out here. It's funny that you I'm mention so that. No, no, it's funny that you mention that because what I want to do is I want to take it off the theoretical level. I want to take it off the level of. Oh man, this is a country that's oceans away. Mm -hmm. I want to bring it close and let you understand that there are masajid in our communities mm -hmm. that host programs mm -hmm. where they talk about fadlu ashura. Nothing wrong with that. The virtue of the 10th of Muharram. Wa muhabbat ahl bayt. And the importance, or ahamiyat muhabbat ahl bayt. And the importance of loving what? Ahl bayt. Because the Shia, they have this special um, affinity for Ashura that's related to what? Their, the history that they believe in and um, the theology that they believe in. Now just think about that. Massage it in our community, which will advertise a program yeah. where they're talking about something which, which all people can kind of get behind. The virtue of the 10th of Muharram, Ashura. We believe in that. But then like he said, they use it as a Trojan horse to bring what? To bring these other beliefs, which are something which will undermine, I'm sorry, undermine the theology of Islam the practices of Islam and the concept of al wala wal bara, which is basically we love those who are loyal to Allah, Muslim and non, -Muslim, I mean, you know, Muslims who are loyal to Allah in terms of their beliefs and their practices, and we what we disassociate ourselves and we're disloyal to those Muslims and non-Muslims who are disloyal to Allah, and that would be ahl bid'ah, the people with these deviant 
beliefs and even understandings that we what? We distance ourselves from them. But when you have this Trojan horse that people, communities do, some communities do, and, and, and it makes you feel like the brother alluded to, that is there some deviousness there? Is there some malicious intent? Are we purposely trying to pull the wool over people's eyes? And I'm, I'm telling you, paints to what I'm saying, paints to my words. Again, because when I talk about communities, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm talking about communities three states over. Okay? I'm saying local communities where it's like Ashura, we can all get behind that. Muhammad al beat. That right there, question mark. Yeah, question mark. Because the people who really promote that yeah. are people, like he said, people who have very different beliefs from the Sunni Muslims. So why are these two things being married? What's the intention? And the unsuspecting person who just looks at that at the face of it and gives Muslims the benefit of the doubt may go there and leave there with what? With a very confused understanding. You guys understand that? And so again, it's important for us to what? Um, we have to basically you know, fortify ourselves with what? With this knowledge. Fortify ourselves with this knowledge so we can't, somebody can't pull the wool over our eyes. Uh, and with that, we'll bring uh, today's session to a close. Jazakum Allah for coming. Alhamdulillah. Um, we'll try to continue in this way. Shorter talks, more discussion and questions that will expand our knowledge and give us an opportunity uh, not to be overloaded. Hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakum. Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.